I am Lynn Shea, and you are listening to Phantasm Podcast. Listen closely. You are listening to Phantasm, the podcast that sells horror movies and metal together with your host, Corey Gorechrist, and Dr. Vincent West. Get your movie collection ready and follow along as they review the latest restoration of cult classic horror films and interview the sickest fans in metal. Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Ah! Ah! Broadcasting from an abandoned morgue in an undisclosed location and blood streaming everywhere, this is Bad Cat. And now you just pick up a host. I'm not sure if you're ready to hear this yet, but unfortunately, I can't waste any time easing you into it. Corey Gore Christ, Phantasm Podcast. This this is awesome. We have uh, the Scream Queen, Lynn Shea. With us today, uh, you can meet her at Horror Hound Weekend this weekend, September 6th through the 8th at the Indiana Convention Center. You can also meet her co-star, Patrick Wilson from Insidious. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, and I'm actually looking forward to the weekend. Um, I just found out also Patrick was going to be there, which will be fun. And um, I'm having a very, I'm having a good time, a good day, and, and a good a good year and a good life so far. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I have no complaints at all. It's great. Yeah, a lot to be happy about. Um, how many conventions have you appeared at so far? That you can I don't um, do very many at all. I'm, yeah. Um, and I don't. I don't want to sound at all snobby because I'm not. I mean, I, I um, I'm not a hundred percent comfortable taking money from people. Um, uh, me neither. In general, <laughs> unless I'm doing, unless I'm really working, and um, you know, it's a. Uh, they charge a fair amount of money for the pictures, and it's best not up to me. I mean, that's set by the convention. Right. Um, I'm very happy to go this time in particular because there's a lot of wonderful things I'm doing to promote, and I love meeting the fans always. They're, I have the most wonderful fan base ever. I mean, the, the couple I've done previously, you really do walk away kind of ignited because um, it's it's you don't often get to... Uh, see the reward that uh, that you put out to people in terms of a joy factor. You know that people really enjoy the work and enjoy the movies I've done, and that's really um, that's why we do it. It's communication. So to get that communication back from the fans is just wonderful. So I'm really looking forward to it to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, and you know, just like doing this right now, this is just amazing for me. You know. Of- seen you on my tv screen since i was very little and you know so many different roles you've played and uh grown as an actress too it's just pretty uh surreal to be talking to you so this is awesome too this is a way to give back to me so yeah i appreciate the time um but yeah i hope you have an awesome weekend there and uh you know hope for the best and i think people will be very excited to see you here this weekend and you know, also the good the good thing about not doing too many and you know there is a thing about you have um, you know, people are going to be very, I think, uh, enthusiastic because I don't do them all the time. And um, I, as I say, I'm happy. The best part of it is meeting the fans. And so I, uh, I hope to give back what they give me this weekend. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. I'm sure you will. Um, I do want to get into the horror roles you've played, but I also want to talk about, firstly, just your humble beginnings because uh, it's actually really interesting. Um I know you started out, uh, your film debut was Hester Street. The cool thing about yes, that, you, you played, you, you acted with Carol Kane, which is also became a scream queen uh, when she oh, played man. Jill Johnson in When a Stranger Calls, which is iconic, you know. So what was it like? Uh, she was also in License to Drive as uh, Miss Anderson, which I love that movie too. But uh, uh, talk about your, your debut role and your experience with that. Well, it's actually quite a, it's got quite a story involved. Um the uh, Joan Silver, Joan Nicholas Silver, who wrote the the screenplay and um, and 
I think also produced it with her husband. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very gritty little piece, basically about the immigrants on the Lower East Side in New York in the early tw in the twenties. Right. And um, I I hadn't done any film before. I mean, I'd done I think one tiny thing for television um, on for WGBH Boston that was based on. Uh, Margaret Sanger, who who was the forerunner of birth control, actually. Oh, wow. was a, I played an immigrant woman who was dying in childbirth. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing I'd ever done. So I met Joan, um, and it, it was very... Also, she was really a forerunner, because a woman director at that time in particular really was not very... Uh, you know, was not heard of particularly very well, often. In 75, and sure. So she, and so she said, just to play the part of this young Polish woman who is trying to earn the most money she can to bring her family over from Poland. So she becomes a prostitute because she can earn more money um, doing that and quicker than she can in the sweatshops, which right. was really the only other employment available to women at that time. And um, there, was a, there was a lovely little speech where she talks to Stephen Keats, God rest his soul, he's, he's no longer on this planet with us, but a wonderful actor. Yeah. Um, there's, there was a wonderful little speech I have to him about that. Um, and otherwise, you know, it's, he comes into the to the brothel, and um, I'm uh, uh, I'm in bed, and I sort of, in, you know, I kind of make an, an invitation to him to come and join me, so to speak. Right. So anyway, I was really excited because I thought this, not only was it uh, exciting for me to be in the film, but um, there was a real heart to this character, you know, that it wasn't just anything... It wasn't just a prostitute. I mean, it, it told something about the time and the place and who these people were to, and the, the amount that family meant to them. So I told my parents, and they were all excited, and there was going to be a debut in New York. And um, uh, so I invited them to come, and um, we sit down, and the movie is great. I mean, it's, it's still a wonderful film. And we get to my scene, and all you basically see is Stephen Keats walk in, and I kind of bend over, and I'm, and you see my breast, <laughs> and, uh, and then I sit back, and that's sort of the scene. Yeah, <laughs> that's sort of it. Right. So my, so I'm sitting next to my mom, you know, and um, and I, I just thought, geez, they cut, you know, they had a cut out, you know, how that goes. They right. cut out my my little dialogue I had, and um, for time purposes and et cetera, and storytelling. So the end of the movie, I'm thinking, well, okay, at least you know it's gonna be they'll see the credits roll and my my credit, you know, I'm, I'm all excited. So the credits roll and they roll and they roll and the final last credit it says Lin Shay Horror. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And my mother stood up <laughs> yeah. and walked out of the theater into the ladies' room and threw up. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> wow. Yeah, that would be similar to my luck too with a film debut. I feel like. <laughs> but um, but anyway, but I was still proud to be in it, you know. But it was sure. it, it taught me. Listen, it teaches you a lesson too about expectation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you you have to realize reality and expectation are two very different things. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I think Carol Kane was nominated for an Oscar in that she film. Was for an Oscar. Yeah. For that. Crazy. And I haven't seen her in years and years and years. I think she was so is so gifted and talented. And of course, she was in the Princess Bride. Yeah, which yeah, was yeah. With Billy was, uh, Crystal, which was one of her funny, one of the funniest uh, characters oh, yeah. ever created. I thought. Yeah, I think she and, was Valerie um, in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but I I have no idea. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm assume she works all the time. I you know, there's so many platforms now. You don't know yeah. what anybody's doing. Right. Yeah, that's that's an amazing story. Um, I always wanted to ask about that too. Um, and then you got a call not too long later from uh, Jack Nicholson, and talk about that. Oh the... my God, you're asking me all my longest stories. Yeah, I love it. I want to hear it. <laughs> well, that also has a story. All right, I love it. Um, I I was living in New York, as I said, from you know mm -hmm. from Hester Street as well, and I was doing all theater pretty much, and um. I had actually just been hired to do a wonderful play in Boston with Eva Marie Saint. I mean, these days people don't really know who she is, but right. she was one of our great, really great actresses in the 60s and 70s. And um, she was in uh, On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando, which is yeah. one of the greatest performances ever by from both of them. 
And anyway, so she was, they were doing George Bernard Shaw, they were doing Candida, and I got hired. I auditioned to play, um, there's a character named Prosy, it was the, um, which is a wonderful role of um, Eva Marie Saints, the, her character's Candida, of her secretary. So I was all excited, I was all planning to go to Boston, and about a week before um, I get this phone call from my agent, um, I got fired. And mm. we hadn't even started rehearsals, and I, I was a total mess. I was so upset. And the oh, reason they, they fired me was they said, I, I looked like I was 12 years old on stage. I mean, I really did, I looked like <laughs> a child. Because I was very little, and to begin with, and they said I was making her look too old because she was in her 50s and was supposed to be playing in her late 30s. And I looked like I was 11, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and made her look like she was 90. <laughs> yeah. So, not that old, but I mean, at any rate, that was the reason I was fired, although when you when you get fired, you don't hear anything logical. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just the, the, the crash. Right. So my, age, my agent calls and he said, this is very strange, he said, but Jack Nicholson and, and his um, casting director were just in New York. They're doing this little movie called Going South mm-hmm. that Jack had been wanting to do for a long time. It was something he had uh, written with his, his friend John Herman Shainer, actually, who I'm still friends with, who's a wonderful guy. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And they were going to shoot it in, uh, and he had seen my picture somewhere and was interested in me. I mean, can you imagine? Wow. I, mean, I just got <laughs> and now I hear Jack Nicholson and, like wants to meet me yeah. and they said oh no don't get too excited because they just went back to Los Angeles and I said well, well what do you mean and they said well we sent your picture so I hung up the phone and it's typical being my father's daughter I went into my little library of photos and I started pulling out all these photos and I wrote a little note saying dear Mr. Nicholson I, uh, thank you for your interest these are some other photos of me <laughs> okay, so That's amazing. A blister the size of a basketball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, but I, I just pretended I did, and um, so I check in, and the next morning is my meeting with Jack, and I got all dressed in my little outfit, and um, I must have called the cab company 40, 40 times <laughs> to make sure they were going to be there at nine. Right. And um, go to Paramount, and I had never been to LA. I'd never been here, and I certainly never been to a film studio and it really was that moment of magical where you know those gates open you know yeah. Paramount especially and um, they took me to his office I think in one of the little golf carts so I was mm-hmm. uh, and um, dropped me off and 
I walk into his office, and my picture's up on his wall, and he's got his head down looking at my resume. Mm -hmm. And then he looks up at me with that classic Jack Nicholson, you know, like, head down, looking up at you <laughs> with his eyebrows. Yeah. And he said, what happened to your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And we kind of, I said, oh, no, I didn't really just come out here to meet you. And he knew I had. I mean, yeah. he knew, he, he kind of, and he just said, well, let's see here if there's anything to talk about. And he said, um, I'm, the main role, Mary Steenburgen had just been cast um, as, as the lead. And he said, but I've got, I want special people in this movie because it's a really special movie to me. And there are these four spinsters, but he said, but I could make one a parasol lady, is what yeah. he said. And, um, and that was it. I walked out, and I felt like I'd been shot out of a cannon. And he didn't hire me. I mean, he just said that's what it was for. Yeah. And um, meanwhile, I was checked into the chateau, and uh, I figured I'd stay. I started, you know, it was a real lesson in proactivity, because anybody I called, I got through to. I mean, it was crazy. Because I was like, hi, you know, my name is Liz <laughs> you know, I live in New York, but I came out here to meet Jack Nicholson. I mean, that was all I had to say, sure. which was true. Yeah. And they would go, okay, well, yes, yeah, so you have a reel, or come on in and meet us. And I was meeting all these casting people. And so I've been here three days, I think, and I hadn't heard back from Nicholson yet about anything. Mm -hmm. And because um, he said he would know in a few days. he was, So it wasn't like a, a dead deal, particularly. But I got a job on a movie of the week. I mean, they just offered me this job um, with Judith Light and F. Murray Abraham. Um, and I ended up, and I'd never done a TV show before. And I went and bought all my own props. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, you know. And they were so, and I came in, and a, a very, Jack Arnold, I believe, was the, was the, um, uh, the director who was a, was a big TV director. And this was a big movie of the week for ABC. Right. And I think, um, and long story short, I, um, I ended up getting a review of Variety and a great review. And, um, and they all laughed because I brought a turkey leg in. Um, don't even get me started. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I guess I am a method actress. Right. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and Uda Haga taught me that you, you figure out what, what happens right before the scene starts. So I figured I was in the kitchen. I was eating a turkey leg. And I literally <laughs> went to Nate and Alvin and brought a turkey leg with me. And I was dead serious. I said, I brought a prop because I thought this was my idea. And they were all standing there just like jaw dropped. <laughs> looking at me like, who is this and what is she doing? And they used everything I brought. They used my wardrobe. They used the turkey leg. They used the earrings. And um, I mean, when I think back, those are setups that gave me so much confidence in myself, in my ideas. Right. And... Yeah, but it has to do with just doing the work. Right. And um, so, uh, and then a couple days after that, I got a call from, from the casting office and they said, Jack wants you in Mexico for two weeks to be in the movie. It's so amazing. I ended up going, going south. That was how I got there. And uh, John Belushi and Danny DeVito and Chris Lloyd. I mean, it was an all star, crazy little western. Um, that if you've never seen it, it's worth seeing. I mean, and, and he plays kind of this crazy Gabby Hayes esque character, and yeah. Mary is just charming and delightful in it. And I play the parasol lady. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's a it's a beautiful so, film, and uh, you know that's definitely something to be proud of too. And to, to just to be in that moment too for yourself must have been you know crazy just to get to that point. It is crazy, and you know you don't think it is at the moment. I mean, I, if anything. And if there's anything to pass along to young actors and stuff, is don't ever worry about what other people think. I mean, yeah. it's an old it's an old cliche phrase, but it's really true. I mean, if you are doing the work and you're staying true to your work, and always be polite and always be a good listener, those are two very important things. No matter what you do, it's very important to be a good listener and to and to be courteous to people. You know, don't ever override somebody just because you have an idea. Sure. Bring in your idea, but initiate everything in a very courteous and um, humble way, you know, and, you're, and you will be heard. So That's amazing. And then, you know, it just seems like a really good experience for you. And 
to kind of come into your own and bring your own things and it work out that way. And, you totally. Know, it's, it's totally. Awesome. And my, my first outing in L.A. And then after that, I thought, wow, this is easy. I got a review for, <laughs> for a movie the week that somebody gave me, and I just worked with Jack Nicholson. Well, right. Then it went on, I went on to find out how difficult it was. Sure. Course. And then uh, we'll move on to the horror here. Um, the people have probably been, been waiting for, but this has been great so far. I mean, I, I love hearing this. And, uh, and I mean, if I'm talking too much and too no. you know, about too much, okay. But you, you feel free because I, yeah. I get, there's such great stories for me in particular, and so I love telling them. But no, I appreciate you sharing them. These are these are fantastic. Um, Good. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we move on to Nightmare on Elm Street, which uh, you know is still a smaller role. You were Nancy's teacher, and she had that dream and freak out in that scene. Uh, and I know. Uh, your brother Robert Shea, he worked at New Line Cinema, kind of helped he you out. He worked. He created New Line Cinema yeah. in his living room in New York. You yeah. Know, Bob was the, he, Bob, my brother is an extraordinary, extraordinary gift to the film business. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, he, so, so Nightmare on Elm Street, um, Wes Craven had been shopping it around and nobody would do it. Wow. And um, I should let you finish your question, though, because I didn't. I just kind of interjected. Oh, no, go um, ahead. This, like, is, this is great. Um, well, anyway, so Bob, um, they just thought, let's do it. Let's just do it. And, and it was the first, New Line was always struggling. I mean, it started yeah. out as um, a, a young company that was not a film production company at all. Bob got into it um, as a distributor, and his idea, which was very niche and a really great idea, and Bob is a Fulbright scholar, a Columbia Law School graduate, um, who was a young photographer when he was like 11, 12 years old. He was taking photos of, of, I mean, that were like award-winning photos from different magazines and stuff. He's a, got a beautiful, beautifully cultured eye in terms of uh, image and, um, and creativity. Bob's really, I mean, I can't say enough wonderful things about him. He's still my big brother. Right. He used to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> he was a, he's an a amazing guy. So anyway, he, um, he and Wes thought, you know, yeah, let's just get this done. And the bottom line is, um, oh, and so they they had gone into production. I mean, they had Bob first started out as a distributor. Then they they were doing lecture series and um, did and but they acquired some really kind of cool small films. Um, one was a Rolling Stone film, and one was Reefer Madness. That was the yeah. very first one about. And um, cocaine fiends. Yeah. Um, there's, and Bob's got spectacular stories about all that. How he <laughs> tracked them down and tracked down the people that owned them and got the rights. And and Wes, um, so Wes and he um, decided to do this film. And the way I got in the movie is Bob said, Wes, put my sister in your movie. Yeah. <laughs> that was how I got the job. <laughs> and um, Bob was always very, in public, he was very sometimes tough because he would say, this is my sister, Linda. She wants to be an actress. That's yeah. how he would introduce me. And I would just die, you know, standing yeah. there. But in real life, and behind my back, he has helped me in the most extraordinary ways. And many of the great roles that people remember me for are because of Bob. Saying, yeah. put my sister in your movie. Yeah. So um, this was one of them, and the first of, of several. And then uh, what about your experience working with Wes in the scene? And uh Oh, Wes is, oh my God, I miss, I really, I didn't, I didn't spend time with Wes really. I mean, you know, he wasn't like a, a social friend. Right. He was one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. And I honestly mean that. His demeanor was like an angel. I mean, he was this cherubic human being yeah. with this violent, <laughs> you know, with this <laughs> right? violent um, sort of interior of, about with horror and blood and and the devil and demons and, yeah. um, and he was the most unlikely person to make horror films when you met him I mean you would never believe this guy would be interested in that and he also he was just a master a master at, at creating horror in, uh, in such an uh, interesting and at the time especially incredibly creative and unusual way I mean Freddy Krueger was no accident yeah you know it, uh, Robert Englund had ton, has had gazillion to do with creating that persona but it was written by Wes you know right. and, and there it is yeah, it's beautiful you know the scene's really great and I think uh, you know you as an actress in that scene you know pulled it off very well too it's just very well thank done. you I appreciate that yeah I mean I did my homework you know I mean yeah. I, I really when I say I'm 
uh, a schooled actress, it's true. I, um, it's very serious for me. I mean, I don't, it wasn't ever about, I want to be a movie star. I want to be, I want to go to, I never, ever thought about Hollywood, thought about films. I never thought about making a movie. I love storytelling and I love creating the essence of someone else that has my essence in it as well. And um, it, it's a, a magical experience when it works properly and well. And uh, all kidding aside, talking about Uta Hagen, and she was one of my best teachers ever. And I've worked with her and Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg. I'm a lifetime member of the Actors Studio. I'm, I've really studied my work. And I always do that work. And I think that's what gives me a foothold into the reality of the story, which then translates to the audience. So thank you for that. I mean, I, you know, I remember the part where I hit the kid on the head who was sleeping with my pencil. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that just was cause, because I had sort of entered that land you know, of being teacher, and yeah. I'm teaching Shakespeare, and this little Pisher is not paying yeah. attention. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, thank you for the compliment. No, of course, and uh, yeah, that's awesome. And then a quick departure from the horror thing, we'll get back into that. I want to praise you for your role as Magda from There's Something About Mary, because that's still yeah. some of the funniest scenes I've ever watched. And that was a big thing with me and my mom would watch, so that's very uh, special to me, is that movie. You know, it's really translated. The thing that's so great for me about it, too, is it's really, it, 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 it's sort of a timeless piece. It wasn't yeah. just, I mean, everybody sees it. And if you're, even if you're a kid today, it's it's a movie people will tell you to watch. You know, it's, but that goes back also to Bob again. I mean, there's, because um, Dumb and Dumber was a new line project. Yeah. And the character of Mrs. Noogie Born, or Noogie <laughs> Burger, as Jeff Daniels liked to call her, yeah. was, again, one of those roles Bob said, put my sister in your movie. And I didn't know it. I mean, I never knew any of that. You know, um, with Wes I did, but with this I didn't. And um, after, and the Fairley Brothers, you know, that was Pete's first film. And um, after we did that, that Kingpin came next. And yeah. that has another one of those stories where I... I, I, they wouldn't see me for the character. They said she's described as the angriest, ugliest woman God ever let loose on the planet. <laughs> and he said, "We love your work, but we don't think you're right for this role." And that character I created in my bedroom over six weeks with wardrobe and the hair coming out of my nostrils <laughs> and the nose hairs and the, um, and finally, literally at the at the eleventh hour, I begged one of the producers from Dumb and Dumber. So Bob is linked to all of these projects to me. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for Bob, you know, I wouldn't have done Dumb and Dumber. And if it wasn't for Dumb and Dumber, I never would have known Steve Stabler, who was the key person who let me come into audition for um, for Kingpin. Yeah. And the thing is, I went dressed 100%, as you see in the movie, <laughs> to the audition. Yeah. And I sat down on the floor, and the cat, Rick Montgomery, who was their casting director, and still is, Rick works with Pete on everything. Wow. He walked by me, he kept walking by me, and finally I said, Rick. And he looked down, he said, Lynn? And I said, yes. He said, oh my God, I thought you were homeless a woman off the street, we were going to call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> And so I got the job. Yeah. <laughs> and that, of course, I mean, led to something about Mary. Yeah. And um, they didn't hire me so fast. It, they made me audition again. I mean, those guys are tough. Yeah. And um, I didn't I didn't know for sure I got the job until also sort of the last minute. And, um, you know, went to Florida with them for two months. And it was just, uh, I mean... It, it was just such a fantastic experience. And again, I used all my little things that I came up with and uh, Pete received them with goodwill and I think they helped make the character really um, become real. You know, that she was this real person. That, yeah. Um, so, and the dog is <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. And, you know, I've actually known a lot of people that are very similar to Magda, so it's even funnier that you know, I know, I've heard that from a lot of people, yeah. so there she is. This is like the crazy old lady that, you know, looks like a you know, leather bag and is getting, you know, dogs licking their face and stuff. It's yep. hysterical. You know, so it was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, 
I still uh, really cherish those scenes in that movie because it was thank you. probably thank some of the you best. Thank you so much, Corey. Oh, yeah. And uh, probably my favorite role you've ever done, and this one will be another New Line movie, was uh, your Jeremiah's uh, mother, Mrs. Bruce, in Detroit Rock City, where I still I still quote that film and your scenes in that. Me and my brother kind of have a thing where we, you know, we, we quote we quote your scenes from that movie and laugh our asses oh, off. <laughs> so I'm really I'm honored to be honest for real. Yeah. Though, that was also really it was really great. I, I auditioned for it and um, Adam Rifkin is I didn't know Adam and he's just the best guy ever. I mean he's really he's the real deal. You know he's um, he's a real filmmaker. And I also loved it. I loved the story, and Mrs. Bruce really did start to come to life with my little Farrah Fawcett hairdo and yeah. the wig. And um, and uh, it, it's interesting that these films have had real legs. I mean, that they've their generation they've crossed generations. You know, that kids today who see it really still love it. And Eddie Furlong. I mean, all the boys were so great in it, and um, I love Mrs. Bruce. <laughs> yeah, she's probably my favorite. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, you know, just chain smoking, and you lit the the tickets on fire with a cigarette. It's, it's so funny. Yeah, yep. you know, it's good stuff. Is that all stuff you came up with on your own for the character, or is that? Um, some of it, a lot of it was the the smoking nonstop. I think was in the script that she smoked. That she smoked. I can't even remember to be honest. I think so. That I think was part of the story. Um, the lighting, the tickets on fire was in the was in the script. Okay. That was all Adam. Yeah. And um, but the last line of the movie was mine, and it's funny. People have told where I say they grow up fast, don't they? Yeah. And that was a that's a line people have told me they quote. Yeah. And I remember Adam when we were shooting it, he said, "We need something here, and I don't know what it is." And and he said, "You know, because Jam has you know, declared his independence basically, and." Um, and I'm defeated, pretty much. Finally, Mom is put in her place. Yeah. And um, and what was what was some way to wrap it up without it being uh, too didactic, without it being moralistic, without it being sad? And somehow that line just popped up that that that's the truth. They move on, and finally, you know, it's not 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 good the good, not the good, the bad, or the ugly. That's just the way it is. Everybody grows up. Yeah, that's and beautiful. um, so I felt real. And Adam, as soon as I said it, he said, "That's that's it. That's perfect." <laughs> and um, so I feel good about that. Yeah, well, bravo! That's amazing. And uh, yeah, that that that's probably my favorite. So just that alone, and then all the other things you've done, talking to you about uh, just Detroit Rock City, even for a second, was incredible. Because I, you know, that movie came out when I was nine years old, and I still watch it. Oh so my god! Yeah, so it's crazy now to talk to you and. It's been such like a thing that stuck with me and my brother watching that film, and it's like wow. in, it's ingrained in our heads where we quote it all the time, like your scenes, and we wow, laugh. Wow, that's so. that's awesome! I gotta tell Adam. That. Yeah, he'll, he'll be thrilled to know that too. You know, we'll, we'll do the wash. He'll put jeans on and be like, "Those pants are so tight, I can see your penis." You know, we yeah, right. we that joke. <laughs> we we still quote that thing all the time. <laughs> that scene, I remember. That I remember when we were blocking it. It sort of it it sort of. I, I was felt like I was in the theater piece. Yeah. And we, because Adam kind of let me go with that. You know, he kind of let me find the space. And you know, it's interesting. Every director works differently. And um, I'm at best, and this is a theater thing usually. You know, which is not you, in film. You know, often you come in, especially television. Right. You're blocked. They block you before you. You're not even allowed. I remember when I did I did three days on so, a soap opera once. It was the most horrifying experience <laughs> I ever had for me. Because you never run through anything. You don't rehearse anything. You just, they give you the blocking and you stand there on that line and you move over there on that line. And I'm so used to finding my own blocking almost it, organically, right. you know, as you go through the material. And that's kind of how that scene was blocked. I remember fluffing up his pal- pillow. I was getting his bed, you know, making his room tidy. Yeah. That she, everything for her had to be tidy. And that was not in the script. I mean, we just kind of found our way through it. Mm-hmm. And um, so, and you know, that's still my favorite way to work is to have that luxury. Um, but you don't always get it. You know, it's a 
every every director works differently and every medium is different also right oh, that's awesome and then uh, well speaking of medium we'll get into the Insidious franchise we'll go back to horror that's what uh, a lot of people know you from like a lot of the younger people and uh uh, your, your role as Elise in that in that franchise, um, right? And I think it's wonderful too. You know, you over time in that franchise, you develop into such a amazing character. I mean, always like the fan favorite in the first two films, but then when you get to three and four, it's like you know you're at the the center of the whole thing, and it's amazing. You know, the character. And much to ass. my surprise, may I add? I mean, for real. You know, when we started. Well, go ahead. I, I'll let you because I'm. You have a specific question. I'll oh no, you're right. So. Just keep. You're good. Um. Well, what I was going to say is, um, I uh, I met James Wan actually through a friend named Tim Sullivan, who is a wonderful writer director. Um, I did 2000 Maniacs with him. Yeah. With, um, with with Robert Englund actually. And Great film. Bill Mosley. But um, James was, uh, and I don't even think they were very close friends. But Tim was coming over to my house and. James was a fan of a little movie I did called Dead End. Um, it's a great it's movie, too. Guys. It is a great... That's one of my favorites, to be honest. It's one of a lot of people's favorites. It's a very cult um, favorite, yeah. So, but anyway, um, so I met James, and he was just so... He's such a sweet guy. I mean, he's just such a good guy. And he, he didn't really... You know, they had done the Saw series and all that, and he had done a couple other films. And he um, asked me to do a little short he was shooting with Lee Winnell and I didn't know Lee yet either and it was a it's called Doggy Heaven and it's hmm. still on YouTube it's pretty funny I mean it's a, it's a little it's like nine or ten minutes I'll long I'll have to check it out and it's very funny very <laughs> very it's, it, it, that Lee's character I kill him actually I have a little <laughs> dog in it he runs and my dog my dog gets run over and I <laughs> and I kill Lee and he gets sent to dog heaven by mistake that's amazing <laughs> very funny <laughs> And um, so anyhow, so I met I met Lee at that point, and um, a wonderful also Mike Mendez, who's become a very good friend and is a director and um, producer writer also. Amazing. And so um, my family, my horror family, was starting to create itself. And then James called and he said, um, "I have a script that we don't really have a title for, and we're we're tr- I'm trying to get Patrick Wilson and Rose Byrne. Those are my first two choices for the, the leads." And there's a character um, I thought you'd be good for. Would you like to read it? So, of course, would I like to read it? Of course. Yeah. So, um, it was a really scary... That was the first Insidious, and it was really scary. And I remember reading it in bed, and I put it downstairs in the closet <laughs> <laughs> before I went to sleep, for real. I mean, I really did. I just thought it was so creepy. And uh, and Lee's writing is so beautiful. I mean, he's he's... He's, you don't paraphrase Lee. I mean, he really knows how to pick words and create an environment. And the the backstory of the further is the first time we really hear what the further is. And I remember thinking, reading it, the character talked a lot. That was like one thing yeah. I was very I noticed. And um, so James called me back and he said, I I can't believe it, but Rose and Patrick both agreed to do the script and we're going to start shooting. And you know, do you want to do the role? And of course, I did. Yeah, and um, we shot it for three weeks here in LA, a very low budget budget film, and um, that was it. You know, we it, it, we were excited. James thought everybody did a really good job, and blah blah blah. And then it got into Toronto uh, to the film festival, and apparently was a s- screaming hit. You know, and you don't know. I mean, you yeah. really don't. You think you've got something great. And you don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, or you think you've got something mediocre, and suddenly something ignites under it, and it is just great. So this apparently it was a, a midnight screening, and uh, of like two thousand, a huge house they showed it at, and there was a bidding war all night long, and Sony bought it, you know, for international and Universal for domestic, and we were off and running. I mean, that was the beginning, and um, it did. Nobody. That's one of my robo call, one of my robo calls is calling. <laughs> oh, those are fun. Um, yeah. But 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 long story short, that was um, you know. And at the time, a friend James said to me, "Maybe we shouldn't kill you because what if there's going to be a sequel?" And I said, "Don't worry about it. <laughs> there's, there's, whatever." Yeah. And 
so um, there was some talk of there being another one, and um, James said, we, we're going to put you in the further, you know, even though you're dead, if we really want you in the movie. And I still don't understand or, or really know exactly what happened, but I remember Jason Blum calling uh, my manager after the first one, and he, everybody kept saying they really love Lynn's character. The audience really loves Lynn, and and I and you know I talked a lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, 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 I set up the whole further, so yeah. it was a big, um, which could have been very dry, I guess, and very kind of boring. But it, it didn't turn out that way. And so very slowly after the second one, um, Lee and uh, James and Jason said well, we're we're going to write you in more. People really want the character. So um, that was when we deci- they decided to do the prequels. So the third one, you know, it takes place um, obviously before the right. first one, and um, and then that really did really really well. And then they decided to do a fourth one, and I, I to be honest, I was really nervous about it. I thought, I yeah. think this is setting myself up for total failure. <laughs> oh my God. You know, because um, you could hear the critics going. They should have stopped it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they should have stopped at three. They almost didn't, blah, blah, blah. And I thought I was going to get, I really did. I thought I was going to get killed. Uh. Um, and lo and behold, it it all really worked. You know, I mean, and um, there's going to be another one. I mean, we don't know when, but that's the hearsay. I mean, that there will be a fifth at some point. And, you know, Blumhouse is sort of... Um, shameless about their sequels right. that go on and, as long as they're making money. Sure. Um, I am dead now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I am now officially dead. They, no, there's no more prequels. They so it's going to be a sequel to the second film. To... Uh, yeah, it'll be a sequel to the second film. Exactly. Wow. And I think I kind of know what they're thinking of, but I mean, I don't want to say anything because I don't know, um, right. you know when or if. But um, it's been wonderfully exciting to have people respond like that to um, a character. Yeah, and, and you know, it's taken its special place in modern horror, but also horror as a whole, I think, just that character, you know, people can go back and, and you know, remember that role and really piece it with a lot of the other iconic roles in horror, whether it be from the 80s till now or, you know, the early 2000s well, till now, you know, it's it's in there, you know, in the... Thank you so, thanks so much. I mean, I... You know, thank you so much. I I, I do work hard, and yeah. I love what I do. I love, 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 love what I do. I mean, you know, the other thing is to tell people it's problem solving. Mm-hmm. You know, just when you think it's safe to go outside, it's <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you gotta figure it out. So it's 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 really like a, a jigsaw puzzle in any movie, and um, so that these came out so beautifully, and James. Really is really a master of of, um, of image. You know, yeah. He really knows how to and his colors pull and imagery stuff. together. And Lee too. Lee is just a beautiful writer, and he, you know he complains all the way down the line. <laughs> can't get it right. Blah 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 blah. And, and lo and behold, I thought the last one was really a fantastic story. Yeah, I mean, it's I'm awesome. Really privileged to be to be the key. Pardon the expression, but the yeah. you know, key figure <laughs> in it, um, and to have the story told in such a um, really moving way I thought in a very powerful way and talking about real bad stuff that really happens mm-hmm. abuses child abuse is rampant we all know that yeah For, so anyway all's well that ends well <laughs> yeah but uh, you know when I first watched those films you know you're already such a prolific actress to me and like you know I haven't not liked any roles I've ever done you've always been a huge part of my childhood so when these came out, you know, I was already intrigued just by you being in the film and having a, a big role in it. And, uh, you know, by the time the, the prequels were out and you were pretty much the center point of the films, it was just, it was just fucking awesome. So, again, oh, thank, was, you. thank you for, for well, those films. They're great. You're welcome. I feel, I feel privileged. So. And then uh, what's next on the slate for you as far as uh, Oh, projects? boy. It's a busy... A bi- <laughs> Great, a couple of really cool things. Um, Grudge is coming out. They did a reboot of The Grudge, which is coming out on January 6th. Um, Sam Raimi's producing, and an incredible director named Nicholas Pesch, who did this uh, little horror film in black and white called Eyes of My Mother, 
Mm -hmm. It was on Netflix for a period of time. It's one of the scariest movies I ever saw. Oh, wow. and, it, and it's not because there's anything new in it, but he knows how to juxtapose, uh, juxt, juxta, you know the word I'm looking for? Yeah. Juxtapose, juxtapose, Juxtaposition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to put together imagery <laughs> yeah. that is uh, juxtaposed, is the word. Right. Um, in such a unnerving way that even if you think you've seen it before, you haven't. So um, I, and I have a fantastic role. I'm very excited about that. So that's coming out. Um, I also am going to be doing the new Penny Dreadful for Showtime. Oh, wow. That's a great show. I've never done a series. Um, I'm, I'm a, a recurring character, of also fantastic. John Logan is the, is the creator of the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's not Victorian England anymore. He finished with that with the first three seasons and was done. Because he said he had nothing further to say. Right. And um, I don't, not to be too political, but now that we have Donald Trump as president, yeah. he decided it was time to write, to write another one. And um, <laughs> it takes place, it's Los Angeles, 1938. Oh, wow. And it takes place here. It's about, I actually just um, printed out something because it was such a, a fantastic sort of explanation. Let me just see if I can find it really quick. Um, of, of the story uh, I'm going to just kind of read a little bit of this and sure. Los Angeles uh, 1938 a, a time deeply infused with Mexican American folklore and social tension it explores pre-World War II LA from the building of the city's first freeways and deep traditions of American Mexican folklore to the dangerous espionage actions of the Third Reich and the rise of radio evangelism Wow. So. <laughs> yeah, that's good for um, our time right now, for sure. I'd yeah, say. Nazism is alive and well yeah. there and unfortunately still. And um, I play a fantastic character who is, a, uh, I play an old, old lady, like between 80 and 90. Right. And um, she was in the Yiddish theater, and she's uh, a Jew who is, looking for Nazis, basically. I mean, it's awesome. a very powerful storyline. Um, Nathan Lane plays a fabulous role of a detective, and he and I are kind of sidekicks. Oh, my God, so that's it's amazing. Be very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I haven't, I, they've started shooting. They've just started, and um, I work, I don't work for another, I do this convention, and then um, come home, and I begin, I believe, the week of September 17th. And it goes through March, I mean, uh, so I'll be in, but, but it shoots here in Los Angeles. Right. So I'm very, very, very excited about that. A period piece with phenomenal political undertones and overtones. And yeah. And great drama. Fabulous cast. I mean, fabulous cast. Um, and just, uh, again, this, this, this gentleman, John Logan, is, uh, I've never read scripts as powerful as these. Almost ever. No. And, um. But it, you know, it's going to be a new a new deal for me as well because it's it, it's it is still television even though it's Showtime, right? And um, there's rules, <laughs> <laughs> you know. There's rules. I mean, I'm not in charge, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, I'm used to being in charge because in all the indie stuff I do, I have a great thank you, thank, gratefully a great reputation oh, yeah. for my own ideas, and people really want to hear what I have to offer but I have to keep my mouth shut a little bit. On this. You know, I have to be, I have to be, um, I have to learn how to listen, to be a good listener and, um, and still initiate ideas, but it'll be um, an interesting adventure for me and um, in learning protocol, really, because in, in the indie world, the protocol is kind of all over the place. You know, right. it, there are no real rules, and um, except being a good team player, that's always a rule. So I'm very excited about that. And um, there's another film I did called Dreamcatcher, which is that's kind of a working title that I was one of the producers on as well. Oh, wow. It's also a very interesting story with me and Henry Thomas and Rada Mitchell and um, that will be released sometime in 2020. Uh, Lionsgate and Grindhouse are, are that's involved amazing. with distribution. So and they're going to be at a film. Horror Hound as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope so. I yeah. Mean, we'll you know, I have no idea how um, they're still in the editing process. I haven't seen any of the footage or anything, but 
a really good story. And um, who knows what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one other um, project, a, a, a Gothic Harvest is called, which will be released on DVD and um, all the formats, you know, the, I, uh, the VOD and digital, and I think it's best, uh, it comes out in November, I think. October 15th is part of the release, and the other part is November 5th. And um, Bill Mosley is in this project, and it's also kind of a very interesting story about girls uh, in uh, uh, New Orleans during the Mardi Gras. It's a real horror film. Oh, amazing. A true horror film. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, I wish for the best for you, and I look forward to everything you have coming out, and a big supporter of your work, and this has been absolutely amazing, and, you know, I'm really excited for your projects coming up. Well, thank you, Corey, and thank, I really, this has been, a, and also I love the questions you've asked, and thank you for your appreciation. Um, of course. You know, in spite of all the, the, the me, me, me of being an actor. <laughs> no, that's why you're on here, you know, I love it. it. Yeah, it's giving, you know, it's <laughs> like, it's being a, it, it's my favorite way of being, of giving stories to other people, and making them think about things in a new way, possibly, and I mean, that's why I'm an actress, that's what I love, it wasn't about... You know, it's not, never been about any kind of stardom or really ever. I mean, I, 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 I it's fun to be recognized, but for right. the right reasons, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Oh, yeah, this has been absolutely wonderful. And, uh, you know, it, just to pick your brain a little bit and uh, get to know you, and then uh, you have a lot to offer this world as far as acting and teaching, and I think it's it's wonderful. And uh, you got so much more to come, and we're really excited what you got coming thank you so much. well I hope our, I hope I get to meet you in person that would be awesome yeah um, fortunately we'll make it to Horror Hound really bummed about that uh, but you know maybe sometime you know go out to LA I'll see you okay you keep <laughs> in, keep me posted and thank you for the great questions and your kindness I no really problem. appreciate it thank you so much I've had a wonderful time and again you know I wish for the best for you thank you thank you so much thanks Corey okay I'll talk to you again alright thank you you have to be very careful. If you call out to one of the dead, all of them can hear you. <laughs>